Well, hey, Candice, how are you? I'm good, thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, welcome. I am so excited to have you on the show today. Um, you and I met a few months ago, almost a year ago. Uh, you are a radio show host of What She Said and a bunch of other things, and we'll get into that in a minute. But I had an opportunity to be on your show, and I definitely wanted to bring you back onto to mine now that I've started This Is 50. And I think it's kind of a similar message. Um, what she said, you're all about uh, enabling women to uh, pursue their personal and professional careers through the, through the lens and, I guess, through the stories of other women who are also uh, building uh, professional and personal careers type of thing. So um, I wanted to bring you on the show because I know that it hasn't been um, a, a smooth sailing ride for you. Um, to say the least. Definitely have a, 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 <laughs> you have a great story, though. It's, it's a good story because I don't think it's not, it's not uh, something that is uh, definitely uh, only for you. I mean, I think we've all kind of, I, I found myself a lot in your story when I've, when I've talked to you before. So um, I, I, I'm just going to hand it over to you. I want you to take us through a little bit about your background, how you got into the talk show business and yeah, just, just lay it on us. I think, uh, you know, I, if I could find a way to describe what I do, I think it's probably just, um, I just allow myself to be pushed in directions, whatever direction life is taking me. I just kind of go, all right, well, this looks like fun. Uh, and I, you know, how I ended up here at this point at 52, I mean, I never, ever would have thought I would be doing this. Uh, I couldn't even have imagined this, really. And so um, when I started out, I was in the school supply business. Like a long time ago, when my kids were really little, I did this school supply business with a friend. And uh, we had no marketing budget. And somebody said, oh, you should get on Twitter. And I was like, what is that? Like, this was just in the early, early days of Twitter. So I was a very early okay. adopter of Twitter. And I thought, oh, what a fun way to promote my business. And I got on and I was hooked. I mean, this social media thing was fun. Um, I would laugh all day. Like people were just funny on Twitter. It wasn't this polarized place that it is now. In the beginning, it was really about community and just there for the laugh, seeing what you could get in 140 characters to make people giggle. And uh, I just started to find this this incredible community of women um, in Ottawa and Toronto and Ontario, Canada, it just it was sort of just exponentially started to grow. And one of the people I met was Erica M, who when I was, you know, as a Gen Xer, I'm sure you know who she is. Yeah. Um, she was the VJ on Much Music and she was on Twitter and she was talking to me. And I was thinking, I was kind of starstruck at first because I was thinking, I used to watch this woman every day on Much Music. And she said, oh, I'm coming to Ottawa. Why don't we, why don't we take this um, um, offline and meet in person? Like I'm having this, why did everybody come down to a coffee shop? So we, you know, a group of us went down, we met her, had a coffee. And because I had just started this business and she had just started her business, YMC, which was the Yummy Mummy Club. Um, and she was, we were sort of aligned with this, you know, just starting out in business. And she was pulling together a group of women to talk about their experiences, just being a mom. Mm -hmm. And I, as I was sitting there, I was struck with this idea and I just pitched her and I said, do you have anybody writing for you who's been a stay at home mom and is now getting back into the workforce? And she said, no, I don't. And I thought, this is not a bad way to promote my business. It's like a stealth way to promote my business because I have no budget. And so I started writing. And the funny thing about that is I had never written for anybody outside of my diary. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I, I wasn't even sure if I could do it to tell you the truth. And I was, you know, just on the fly, just pitching this idea, which was crazy. And she said to me, yeah, send me something. I love so it. I went home and I, I wrote this article and I sent it to her and I sent it to Sharon, uh, who is a dear, dear friend of mine now, who, who also worked for Eric at the time. And I sent it to them and I didn't hear back right away. And I was just flooded with this incredible imposter syndrome. Like, oh my God, what was I thinking? Nobody wants to read what I have to write. I am an idiot. Oh my God. And then I was tripping over myself, writing them an apology. 
I wrote them an email and I said, I am so sorry. That was awful. Oh my God. And they immediately wrote me back and they said, you're stupid. Only nicer. (laughs) And they said, this was hilarious. We loved it. We want you to be like a regular contributor. We're just trying to come up with a byline for you. And that's how sort of this sea mummy juggle moniker that I started to write under started. And from there, it's just been one big journey of allowing myself to be pushed whichever way sort of the wind is blowing. And writing became very fulfilling for me. I I felt purpose sharing my story. I felt like I was helping and making people laugh. And because I'm very self-deprecating in my writing, you know, I, and, and I think that's important to, to stay that way. And yeah. And then I, you know, I was talking with a travel writer who I met through writing and I said, Oh my God, I want your job. Like, how do I start travel writing? And she said, start writing about travel. (laughs) I remember you told me that part of the story and I just laughed. I thought, exactly. Like, it's like this aha moment. But let's back up for a second. So you started out uh, with a a school supply company. Okay, so take us a little bit through there. Like, what happened? How? Why did you leave that That. Well, it was this great, fun idea we had. Uh, We were like, you know, the school supply lists go home to the parents every year. You have to run around and get them. And we thought, well, wouldn't this be great if we could just pull it all together? Uh, We had seen this idea in the United States and we thought, this is good. Like, we could pull it all together, put it in packages, deliver it to the school, give a kickback to the schools. And we were moms of young kids. Like, we felt the pain of those lists. Mm -hmm. This was a real pain point for parents. Like, I mean, running around looking for a gray duotang, you know, and every color but available. And, you know, just all that frustration. Mm -hmm. And so we started it. And the first year, it was just fantastic. And then the second year, you know, we had quadrupled, or sorry, tripled our uh, sales and quadrupled our profits. We were rolling. And then in the third year, we got hit with this ridiculous government memo that came out that said parents no longer had to buy school supplies. We're no longer required. It wasn't mandatory. And what this was a way of doing was the government's like way of talking at both sides of their mouth, saying it's not necessary because they were helping low-income parents as they should. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what they were also doing was say had they had to do it across the board. And so parents who, you know, could afford to buy school supplies were like, oh, cool. So we don't have to buy them anymore either. But that was not really what was happening here. Mm-hmm. But they put all that pressure on the schools who now had to turn around and say, we can't ask you for lists anymore. Right. So or there we goes have to your do business, it. your whole business. There goes our business, blown up. Okay, perfect. Okay, so now. And blown. Now it's like, oh my God, what do we do? And we sort of reeled for like a year. And then we, we thought, you know, oh, private schools. Uh, let's see what if they're interested. And so we went to them and they were. And so we started to grow again and whatever. But in the meantime, I just kept feeling this pull towards the writing. Right. And the media, the true, and it wasn't true my, calling. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And it, it just wasn't. My heart was just really not in the school supply business. And mm-hmm. so, Lori, my business partner, she was like, you know, yeah, you you gotta go, spread your wings, like go. Mm-hmm. And so she just took over the business. It was a very, you know, very agreeable s- split of ways. And and um, yeah, and then I just started into this writing. Uh, I started into working with brands. I started working behind the scenes with uh, YMC on marketing and, uh, you know, getting mommy bloggers into the space, getting them paid and building community. And ever since then, I think that's what I've sort of been on a mission to do. And no matter what I do is build community with women, because I've always hated this notion that we're just we're bitches and we're out Mm -hmm. to get each other and we're evil with each other. And that's just not been my experience. Right. And so. I just, wherever I go, that's what I try to do is just build this great community of women uh, around me and that I can be a part of and and feed off that energy that comes from when women do great things for each other. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I definitely know that is you in, for sure, because I've listened to a lot of your uh, radio show um, and you're bringing in some really wonderful women who are doing some amazing things and just showcasing them. It's, it's amazing. How, when you, when you say 
you know, the community, I know you, you mentioned like your, your net worth is really your network. And I, I know that you've used your network a lot to take you down this path of getting into the talk show business and into podcasting. So tell me a little bit about that. How did you, I know you, you had mentioned earlier about how do I become you with this travel writer? Well, you just get started. That is uh, some probably some of the best advice you probably got. Um, so tell me, so so tell me from there what happened. So from there, I just I started to write about travel and just very organically write because we did travel a lot, and so mm-hmm. I just started to write about our experiences, and all of a sudden I started to get offers to go places and write about it and talk about it, and it just continued. And then this opportunity came up. I had done it for about, I think about six years before um, this opportunity with what she said came up. And I heard that they, uh, the travel, their travel expert was leaving and they were looking for a new one. And I just, I didn't hesitate. I just jumped at it. I was like, I want this. I want this role. And so I reached out to Kate Wheeler and said, I'll take it. And she said, but you're in Ottawa and we're in Toronto. I said, I don't care. I said, I will travel down once a month to be on your show because they required people to be in the studio at the time. Oh, yeah. And so she said, if you're willing to do it, I'm willing to have you. So that's how it started. So I did that for three years. Uh, I would be on the show once a month. I would come on. I would talk about you know travel and, and things I had done and you know give recommendations to people. And then in uh, 2019, Kate and Christine, Kate Wheeler, Christine Bentley, who were the co-owners of the show, came to me and they said, look, we're kind of done with this. We've been doing it for a long time, but we want to hand the show off to somebody we feel is passionate about the space. And we think that person is you. Would you be interested? And I said, I would, but I'm going through this highly contentious divorce, as you know, yeah. and I don't have the funds to just purchase uh, a show. I, I couldn't even go get a loan for it if I wanted to. And... um Kate said to me, you know, that's fine. You know, uh, let's do this. And so we came up with this payment plan and I would just pay her monthly um, for the show over a two year period. And so January, 2020, the reins get handed over to me. You know, all the pieces are coming together. I'm going to Toronto uh, weekly uh, to do the show uh, because people, again, still required to come into the studio at that point. And My thought was, you know, January, February of 2020, I will move closer to Toronto so that I can be near the studio and so on and help grow this property. And then, of course, we all know what happens. March 2020 hits and (laughs) everything, everything changes. And so suddenly, (laughs) yeah, and all my sponsorship dollars literally dried up within a week. They were gone. Every single business that was sponsoring my show said, see ya. And they exited stage wow. left because everybody was nervous, right? We didn't know what was coming. And I was suddenly at home uh, with my two teenage daughters. We had a third living with us. I had taken in a friend of my daughter's. So I had a third that was with me. Uh, we're locked in this house. And suddenly I have to learn how to record my show at home, get the sound right. I mean, it was awful at first it was so bad it was echoey and there was dogs and there was kids and there was just chaos but the beautiful beautiful part of it was it was chaos for everyone (laughs) every woman who came on my show and so before I before I even before we were using the words she session and how women were disproportionately affected I knew it I knew it within the first week because I could see the stress and the strain on every single woman I was interviewing who, who were worried and sick. Like, what is happening? This was scary. I mean, we've been in this two years. We've adapted. But in those first days, there was so much uncertainty about what was going on. Was this going to be this, you know, I mean, yes, it was a deadly pandemic, but was this going to be potentially even more than we thought it would be? There was so much to think about and contend with. And it was kind of at that time that I realized what she said had to be a vehicle for women's voices. And I made, I I don't want to say controversial stance, but I made a stance and said, from here on, only women on my show. And if you have a business and you want to come on my show and, you know, do a segment, then go find a female voice to represent your brand. 
I've turned down businesses who've, who've said, well, we only have a male spokesman. I'm like, well, that's unfortunate. Then you should probably work on diversifying and getting a woman uh, to be a spokesperson as well. And a lot of businesses, they were like, oh, you know what? We actually have somebody who we'd like to groom for this role. So let's get her on your show. And that was great. And sometimes they'd go, no, sorry, we just don't have anybody. I'd say, that's fine. We're not a fit. And so that sort of defining what the show meant was very empowering to me. And I hope very empowering to the women that started to come onto my show, realizing it was sort of a mansplaining free zone. They could speak freely on all topics. I mean, there's nothing we don't discuss, but if there's a man who could talk about it, there's a woman who could talk about it. That's sort of been my, yeah, no, my view I on it. That. I think that's wonderful. And actually I didn't know that part of the story. So it's really interesting. I didn't know that you had uh, sort of, a, I've always known you just only have women on the show. So that's really good, uh, good story. So, so you, you don't have the money to, to purchase this, this show, but it's, it's essentially been your life over the past, you know, how many years was that, that you were working with? Um, uh, well, I was with them for three right. and then, yeah. And then I took over the show, right. um, in January of 2020. Right. So you don't have the money yeah. COVID hits and you guys agree to make some payments. Um, monthly payments to take over the show, COVID hits and everything sort of dries up, right? You, you're, you're pivoting. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. I mean, I'm still unfortunately going through this highly contentious right. divorce, so but now we've thrown in a pandemic. That. Yeah. Yeah. And so we'll get to that in a second. And then, so, but I, but the problem was I, I have this massive commitment now to Kate and Christine to purchase the show. And <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. So I am digging into my personal savings at this point. I'm pulling it on my RSP, like I'm continuing because I just believe in this property so much and I just, you know, I'm committed. So I'm bootstrapping it. I'm pulling it out of every savings account I have to keep it going. And a year goes by and the show's really struggling uh, as everybody is. And I get this call from Christine, uh, sorry, Kate, sorry, calls me and says, I believe it was like October of uh, 2021. Yeah. No, was it? I can't remember now. Anyway, yeah, it was a year goes by. And she calls me and she says, um, yeah, sorry, it was October of 2020. And she calls me and she says, we're coming up on one year and we're done. And I was like, what do you mean we're done? And she said, I know, I know this has been hard. And you haven't asked for it and you haven't said anything. And I just know this has been hard. And I bald. I couldn't, I'm crying right now, actually. I, my, I got choked up. I couldn't talk and I just sobbed. And I was so incredibly grateful to Kate for recognizing that, right? And that is the most beautiful part of this community of being part of this really supportive community is that you often don't have to say anything. Women just know, we just know what we're going through. And that she was able, that she did that for me was just one of the most beautiful things anybody's ever done for me in my life because she knew that I valued this property that it meant so much to me and that she recognized that and said you know it's good we're done I just oh yeah. like I still get choked up you know, it's just it was beautiful I have a question for you so <laughs> how, were you used to drawing on your village or your community um, for for support during any type of no yeah I, I right no I like strong. I'm like I'm like Miss Independent mm. I can do it on my own thank you very much and interestingly enough I because of like I was always about I am here to pump you up mm -hmm. I am here to do for you exactly and in the last couple of years you know I, I it's just been given back to me a hundredfold I am just so grateful and so damn lucky because it's just been given back to me a hundredfold. Right. And so in your mind, so she, it's Kate? Kate Wheeler, Kate, yeah. yeah. Kate calls you and says, okay, we're done. You, you're, you're like emotionally, wow, I can't believe this is happening. And so you accept the, the gift, if you will. And then, and then, so then what happens now? So now you're, you've got the show, you're full, full on, you're committed to it. We're sort of coming out of COVID a little bit. 
we, I think we still, in this part of the story, we still have maybe about another year or a year and a half left in COVID. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so then what, what's going on? So, you know, uh, th again, through all this point, I'm going through this divorce and, you know, it's, it's hard to keep my show on the air because I have, I interview six women a week. Um, because my budget was so restricted, I became, I still am the, uh, you know, I find the interviews, I arrange the interviews, put them in the calendar, do them, conduct them, produce them, put them out on social media. It's, it's a lot. And um, so I'm doing all of this. And in the meantime, because of this divorce that I'm going through, my children are suffering, um, you know, uh, mentally they're struggling and they're just, they're just not doing well. And because we've also thrown them in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I, I, I cannot, I mean, my children, my daughters, uh, I, I just, I have the utmost respect for them. Really. They have come through life's biggest challenges. Uh, not easy. You know, divorce is not easy for kids having to move, having to move schools. And then, you know, right when they're ready to spread their, spread their wings, start rebelling, seeking independence, we say, Hey, by the way, you can't see anybody and you can't go anywhere. You know, I, I mean, kudos to these kids really who have come through this. Uh, but I, I give special props to mine because they also were dealing with other things. And of course, as all of this craziness is whirling around them, us as a mother, it's just instinctual. You just, when your kids are crumbling, you're crumbling. There, you know, you cannot, you could, can't help it. And so I was pulled from work the entire time. I was having a hard time focusing. Um, and, and then I was being sucked in with divorce stuff, you know, hours and hours with lawyers and with the family responsibility office and trying to get ready for a court case and, you know, doing forensic accounting and just all of this crazy stuff. And so my income, you know, which was huge. And so my, a huge hit was, you know, prior to leaving my marriage in 2018, I was making over a hundred thousand dollars a year as a self-employed individual. I had several contracts, things were going well. And then, you know, yes, some of that dried up during the pandemic, but also, you know, if you're not in this space, if you're not front and center in media, people forget about you really quick. And so sponsorships started to dry up. And I wasn't the kind of person to get on social media and share my story. Um you know, they, they say you should share from, from scars, not wounds. And so I was like waiting to be scarred, not wounded. And, uh, that, you know, I'm still being wounded, <laughs> frankly, but it's, it's, it's getting better. Uh, but, um, so I wasn't sharing, so I just wasn't in the space and it just, I went from like a hundred thousand to $16,000 in income. Uh, that was devastating. My ex-husband stopped paying child support. Um, he never paid spousal support and he simply refused to get a divorce. He just wouldn't participate in this process. And because the family court system is so broken, it took me four years to get a divorce from somebody who just would not participate. I mean, bonkers, absolutely bonkers. I mean, I think at the end of the day, your story is so, it's not unusual. I mean, when you talk about the family courts, you talk about trying to get divorced, you're trying to, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. So how, so during this whole time of, of, you know, starting the radio show, um, and you talk about, you know, also to, when, in our earlier conversations about, there's not a lot of women in radio either. So there were some issues that you were probably dealing with there as well. So what, what made you um, decide to leave the, the marriage in the first place? And I, I, I think like when we get a little bit older, um, in our 50s especially, I think there's a lot of women that are probably sitting there thinking, oh, I probably need to leave my relationship, but they really don't know how to leave. Um, and, and some of them can't even financially afford to leave. Um, so in your case, what made you finally decide to leave? And, you know, that was a big risk. You know, you, like you said, you didn't really have this sort of safety net of this stable 
you know, nine to five job, not that they're, those are very stable either, but you know, you didn't have that with you. You were an entrepreneur. Like you said, you're, you're constantly hustling. You, you're a one man band show kind of thing. One woman show. Um, you're, you're, you're recording, you're, you're sourcing, you're producing. So yeah. Like why would you ever decide to leave and what gave you the strength to leave? And yeah, tell us a little bit about that. So I think, you know, um, you know, you can always look back and say, oh, you know, like, and you analyze things through a different lens. But I mean, ultimately, we grew apart. We were not the same people we were when we initially got married. And, you know, sometimes couples grow together in the same direction. And sometimes they just grow apart in completely different directions. And that is what happened in my marriage. We just, we were just not on the same wavelength anymore. And the catalyst, the, you know, the, the incident that, uh, prompted me to leave, um, you know, I, I don't really want to get into that too much, but suffice it to say, it was enough of a push for me to sort of burn it to the ground and say, this is it. I'm done. Like, I cannot take another minute of this. And I just left. And it was not graceful. It wasn't wonderful. It wasn't, you know, it was just, I had pent up frustration and anger, I think, so long that this one moment just pushed me to say, yeah, I cannot do another second, not another second of this. And um, yeah, and from there, it just, it just dissolved into chaos. And um, I tried to have it go to a mediator. And, you know, to handle it that way. And he just wasn't having any of it. And, and I sort of knew what was coming. You know who you're married to. I sort of knew that there was going to be difficulties. And he had laid all that out in a bunch of emails to me early on in the uh, separation of sort of what was to come. But I thought, he's angry, right? Like, he'll calm down. He'll come to his senses, right? Because what else is, what other choice is there? Well, I found out what the other choice was, <laughs> you know, just pure vindictiveness and um, just kept going and going with that path. And then in like uh, December of uh, 2021, I, you know, the judge had finally awarded me the home um, to pay for the equalization, spousal payment, back pay of child support and so on. And when I came walking into the home, um, he had caused over $200,000 in damage intentionally to the home. Uh, shut the power off at the source, flooded the basement. It had been sitting that way for about a month. Uh, there was mold growing all over the walls, the ceilings. Uh, we had to pull all the, like, the moldings out of the house, uh, like the floors and ceilings, and there was mold growing behind them. Like mold's insidious. It gets into everything. Um, so just even to remediate the mold out of the house was about $30,000. Um, and that is, you know, unbelievable. So of course I have to go back to the judge and say, uh, yeah, what, what are we going to do about this now? Right. And so, uh, we were able to see some personal assets to help pay for the damage, but it will never, ever cover the damage. It's all uninsured. Yeah. And, um, and then through that process, just finding out, really, really getting a grasp of how broken the system is. Like the police wouldn't charge him because they couldn't prove intent. Uh, and this was a civil matter. I mean, it's just, it, it's just so crazy. And the even crazier part of this to me was I thought, oh, wow, like look at how extreme this case is. This is unbelievable. Well, women started to come out of the paper, uh, out of the woodwork to me, uh, sending me messages this happened to me. This is my story. I'm going through this right now. And it's, it's just everywhere that this is happening. And there's sort of this unofficial divorce playbook, divorce for dummies being passed around, uh, you know, this, how to screw over your ex-partner. And they do it because they know that the courts have no teeth. 
that they don't do anything, that they don't follow up in a timely manner. So my ex went, hey, YOLO. And for the last four years, you know, just lived his best life, I guess. And, um, you know, now consequences are catching up with him. But unfortunately, it doesn't solve anything for my daughters. It doesn't solve anything for me. And it certainly doesn't solve anything for him. And that this was allowed to happen, that this was almost enabled by the court system. It's, you know, no, so broken. I, it, it is broken. And you're right. There, I'm, there's probably a million stories all, like identical to that, let alone the other millions of stories that are close to it. So you talk about the push, right? That push. And, and I know that a lot of the women that I'm talking to um, that, you know, when they finally decide to do something different, it's always been something, some catalyst for change. Why do you suppose we wait for the push and not just go earlier when we're thinking about doing something, we don't just get started? <sighs> Fear fear of the unknown, uh, being alone, the impact it will have on those around you. Uh, you know, I worried constantly about, you know, what this would have, the impact this would have on my daughters, not knowing um, that my daughters saw it all. They knew it was broken. And not only that, their relationship with their father was uh, beyond broken, even words that I even knew, really, it was a lot of it came to light after. And um, so we don't leave because we, we don't want to make things worse, but often staying makes things worse yeah. as well. And I think I had left my marriage once um, about, you know, I think it was about eight years prior to when I left the final time. And Hindsight, I should have just stayed gone the first time. I mean, there were problems there, obviously, to leave. Can I just um, pause? And right. I should have stayed and, gone. And, and I want to talk a little yeah. bit about that because it's not just leaving a marriage. It's or like when you, when we when we decide to finally leave, it's it probably is a little bit too late, or or to stop doing that one thing. It's it's it it is probably it's gotten to that state where wow, we just, we should have left or we should have done it a year ago or two years ago. Um, when, when you are, when you're thinking about your, you know, oh, I, I, I left and then I came back. Um, I think that we do. What, what, what made you go back? Like, was it this sort of sense of, it, to me, sometimes I feel like when you, you try something new, it's very uncomfortable so when you're sitting in that state of uncomfort and you're trying to forge forward in whatever that new thing is, you really kind of want to go back. You're, you're, it's your ego. It's that little sort of voice in your head that's saying, oh, just go back to the easy button, the easy button. And, and I know that there's a mm -hmm. lot of people I've talked to lately where, you know, they had to make some radical changes in, during COVID um, where they actually have been, they made some really great changes um, but now they're kind of like trying to slip back into what they were doing before COVID because it was just sort of a temporary thing. Um, and maybe it's largely because the success of, of that currently, that new thing isn't as good or, or as positive as it was, but you had the 10 or 15, 20 years to build that previous thing. And I think that's what a lot of people forget is that it takes time to build something. And, you know, it's that cliche of that, you know, where you see the pyramid of the, the, the iceberg above the water, not pyramid, the iceberg above the water. And, and then all this stuff under the water is the blood, sweat, tears, time, all that kind of stuff. And I think we forget that. And so if you, if you had to say like the three things you would do differently um, with your divorce and, and, and starting over essentially, what would you say those three things would be? Um, I mean, I would have, I would have stayed gone the first time. And I, I would say to everybody, if you're in a marriage and you feel compelled to leave, it's likely like really sit with that, really sit with that before you go back. Because I, I think that 99% of the time things are not going to work out. If, if, 
you have enough. Yeah, if you leave the first time, things are not going to likely work out. Now, that might not be the story for everybody, but I think that's probably the case. The second thing I would say is, you know, I wish I'd been more honest with myself um, about my capabilities. I really thought um, I needed to be part of something. I needed to be partnered with somebody uh, to be whole. And I think one of the most valuable lessons I've learned is that one is a whole number. I love it. You know, um, and I, I, I'm fine on my own. Now I have a partner now and I, I adore him. I love him. He's a wonderful man. Uh, we will never discuss marriage. Like that is foreplay to me. When he says, I won't ask you to marry me. I'm like, good. (laughs) We'll be together forever. Uh, but um, he's a true partner in every okay, sense of the word. About that. And uh, what that's is wonder- a true partner. Yeah. And, it, and a true partner doesn't, it can be somebody, something different for everybody. But for you, what is a true partner? He, um, well, I'll give you an example of just, you know, just mm-hmm. in the house. Like, j- this is a minor thing, and I'll give you a major thing in a second. But a minor thing is, you know, I make dinner. I love cooking. So I make dinner all the time. I, you know, I'm going gonna, gonna to feed myself. I'm going to feed everybody. And I love cooking. But he will say, You've made dinner. And so he will take care of the cleanup process from start to finish. He doesn't leave half of it hanging around. It doesn't, you know, he does the dishwasher every single day. He cleans up the dishes every single day. He, you know, he doesn't, um, half-ass at half-ass that whole process which is which is great and I love that and so that's a little thing he does in the home but some of the bigger things he does is he's incredibly supportive of of what I do and he is always encouraging me to just keep going and he's like you know if you could leave because I talk about just packing it all in going to find a nine to five because it would be so much easier (laughs) and a regular paycheck would be awesome. And, um, I could do that. And, and so we, he says, you know, you could do that, but then that light in you, that passion that I see, that'll be gone. So he doesn't, so he encourages me to just keep going with this, which is also good. And then in terms of the relationship, you know, one of the things that really, really hurt my daughter, uh, with her, with her father was, I, there was some conversation that happened. Now this is relayed through her. So, you know, take it for what you will. But she was, uh, she said to her dad, you know, can you and I just have some alone time together? And he said, no, my new partner is coming. We're a package deal now. And that just gutted her. Like it gutted her. And I was telling my partner this story and he said, no, no. He said, you're a package deal with your daughters. It's not the other way around. Like I take you, I take your daughters. And he has been that invested in their lives and to make it better for them because it means so much to me. And that has been crucial, I think, in in just building that trust between us. And uh, yeah, I just, I really lucked in. But I also know that I can 100% do it without him. And I don't, not that I'm getting rid of him or anything, but I do know that I could also do it without him. And that power didn't come to me until much later in life. And I wish for my daughters that they know that because I think we grow up now, like again, looking at it through the lens of society and the patriarchy and all of this now, I look back at that and go, oh my God, I spent, ugh, like so much of my life going, I got to get married. I got to find a husband. My, my clock is ticking. Like, Oh my God, the stupidity. I just wish I did not. That's, that's not my fault necessarily. That is society's fault that we do this, but we have to start telling young girls that independence is, you know, is a good solid thing and you could be happy. You don't need another person to complete your life. Uh, you know, or that other person could be a best friend or a group of friends or, you know, like there's just other options out there. We just sell this one line to young girls. It's all about getting married and your beautiful wedding day, you know, and we don't talk about what happens after. Yeah, no, and I love that. And 
So how do you, how do you, if somebody didn't go through something sort of like a, like an event, I guess, I, that's what I'm going to call it, the event that, that creates this push to do something different. What would you say to a woman in her 50s who's listening to this podcast who's, has, who has had like a pretty great life, but yet still is not fulfilling that, you know, that fire in the belly, the passion, the purpose, the things that, you know, that your now partner is saying, you can't quit doing what you're doing because it's, it's a life purpose for you. So what would you say to that woman that yeah. hasn't been feeling the that that purpose but yet hasn't had the push? Yeah. I mean, I would say start start by surrounding yourself with people you admire. People that are doing what you want to do. Don't, you know, you don't have to overhaul your life in like one go. It doesn't have to be this dramatic exit like I had. You know, you can genuinely just, um, you know, start to move your life in that direction and see how it feels. Try it on for size, you know, uh, by hanging out with women who inspire you, who absolutely are living the life that you want and start asking questions. Women have been like, again, I just, I'm not a gatekeeper. If you want to know how I got in this business, we can talk about it anytime. And I, most of the women that I know are also not gatekeepers, but this isn't complicated information, right? Right. This is, like I said, you want to write about travel, start writing about travel. <laughs> you know, just, just, just start doing it. And it's not going to be like, nobody jumps into this business and is an immediate success or any business for that matter. Uh, but yeah, definitely find, find people to role model, look for mentors. I mean, you know, that's, that's what I would say is the, yeah, the place I to love start. That. I love and that. yeah, you don't, it doesn't have to be this extreme exit, you know, just look for people first and build up that little group that supports you that, you know, understands and can empathize with you. Uh, it's really important. And, you know, depending on where your relationship's at, like how, loving or unloving it is, is really going to depend on, on that conversation with your partner as well, right? If you, if you still have a mutual respect for each other, if you're still a sort of on the same wavelength, but not really, uh, but you're more roommates than lovers, then maybe you can just have a normal conversation about that and what that looks like and how you can move up forward. But if there's like a lot of stress and tension and um, hatred, really resentment, like it does, you can move from love to hatred in a marriage pretty quickly. You know, if you're at that point, you know, yeah, you, I, I would start, life's too short. Even after everything I went through, how painful and awful and terrible it was, still glad I'm not living in that marriage because that was just, that was stress right. every day. Yeah, no, I love that. So it's, it's drawing your community. It's finding, you know, even just a one or two, two people that, you know, you're thinking, oh, maybe I kind of want to do something like this. So you go out, you find those people, you start to have a conversation. And then I, that point, like, I, I want to be a travel writer. Like, you wanted to be this travel writer. How do I be you? Yeah. Uh, you just start. You just get started. And that, I think, is so important. I know that a lot of people have asked me, like, how did you start your podcast, Lynette? Like, how did you get started? And I thought, oh, my God, do I, should, I, should I give them this, this, like, really crazy story? Or should I really just say what I did? And I thought... I created this podcast and I literally, I actually drew on my time with you and I asked you what, what platform were you using? Perfect. What mics and stuff? I, yeah. I'm a little bit limited. I can't, I don't have a lot of room in my luggage, so I don't have the beautiful mic. I still use these unprofessional. Some, a couple of people have said, oh, they're so unprofessional, Lynette. Honest to God, I really don't care. Um, I'm, for me, it's more about, bringing just really good content uh, into the world that and, and, and showcasing women's stories. But yeah, so it's just getting started. It really, I, I thought about it and I did it. Like I, we came up with a name. I think yeah. it probably was maybe two hours of my time. Purchase Riverside.fm. This is what the, the platform we're using. 
um, and just got started, reached out to my community. Hey, you want to be on my podcast? I really admire who you are. I'm going through my yep. Instagram account. Oh, I've never met this woman. I now I want to meet her and now I want to hear her story. And it's been really interesting. And so I think the key message there is set yourself down a path and those things start to show up for you. And that's exactly what happened to you. You got into the travel writing, you got, you know, you really drew on your network um, and, and yeah, and then found the show and then purchased the show. And I think you're bringing some really great messages to everybody. So Candice, you're, you're, you're a wonderful woman. Um, you're definitely a strong, well, uh, resilient woman. And I think your story is worth sharing <laughs> and thank you for sharing it. And I want to thank you so much for being on uh, my podcast today. So where can people find you, Candice? Oh, gosh, I have so many uh, channels now. I have a hard time keeping up. Yeah. So, I mean, you can find me, honestly, if you Google Candace Sampson, you'll find a whole bunch of hits. But what she said, talk.com is a uh, radio podcast. Uh, Lifeandpleasantville.com is my travel space, sort of my personal little uh, happy place corner of the internet. And uh, on social media, you can find me at Candace Said on TikTok and Twitter, Life in Pleasantville, and What She Said Talk. Yeah. So there's all kinds of channels you can find me. Um, awesome. I'm around, basically. So I, around. I, I love to go to whatshesaidtalk.com because everything is there and you can link to it everywhere. So um, that's where I'm going to put it in the show notes where you are. And Candice, thank you Perfect. so much for being on the show today. And I really, really, really appreciate it. And I hope to see you soon. Uh, thanks, Lynette. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>